pride is a deceptive and deadly enemy. It's like drunkenness. Once you're under its influence, you, you seem to lose the ability to see just how deceived and foolish you've become. It's not that way when others are prideful, is it? We see that in them right away. It's easy to spot. They, they look like idiots, don't they? Aren't you glad that when you're prideful, you don't look that bad? Oh, wait, you do. You know, describing someone as being drunk with pride, yeah, that's pretty accurate. Pride impairs our, our, our reason, our perception, our judgment. Uh, both pride and drunkenness, by numbing our perception, they keep you and only you from seeing the domination and destruction that it does to your dignity, to your purpose, and to your relationships. Humility, on the other hand, has just the opposite effect. Whereas pride impairs our senses, true humility heightens our senses. Now, I feel like I have to clarify that, that I'm not talking about false humility. Okay, I'm not talking about that, that over-the-top, self-deprecating facade that is uh, really just a begging for affirmation and uh, nothing more than a veiled prompt for others to sing our praises. I'm not talking about fishing for compliments by playing yourself down. Uh, I'm not talking about uh, the person who points out their, their rather astounding and tremendous humility in all things. I'm not talking about falsely describing those things that are our strengths as if they were weaknesses. No, real humility doesn't focus on self, but rather it is forgetful of self. Real humility thinks of others and it notices others. It, it serves them. And real humility not only sees others, but it actually allows us to see ourselves more clearly and more deeply. True humility. That's what we want, isn't it? And yet, we are all incredibly prone to pride. And we are all rather reticent to embrace humility. And so we have to be ever vigilant, always on our guard, lest pride creep in. Our passage this morning in 1 Samuel 18 should be a help for us in spotting pride within our lives. Will you do this? Grab your Bible, open to 1 Samuel chapter 18, and then will you stand with me? I'll read our passage, but I very much would like you to follow along in your own Bible. 1 Samuel chapter 18, beginning in verse 1. When David had finished speaking with Saul, Jonathan was bound to David in close friendship and loved him as much as he loved himself. Saul kept David with him from that day on and did not let him return to his father's house. Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as much as he loved himself. And then Jonathan removed the robe he was wearing and gave it to David along with his military tunic, his sword, his bow, and his belt. David marched out with the army and was successful in everything Saul sent him to do. Saul put him in command of the fighting men, which pleased all the people and Saul's servants as well. As the troops were coming back, when David was returning from killing the Philistines, the women came out from all the cities of Israel to meet King Saul, singing and dancing with tambourines, with shouts of joy and three-stringed instruments. As they danced, the women sang, Saul has killed his thousands, but David his tens of thousands. Saul was furious and resented this song. They credited tens of thousands to David, he complained, but they only credited me with thousands. What more can he have but the kingdom? So Saul watched David jealously from that day forward. The next day, 
An evil spirit sent from God came powerfully on Saul, and he began to rave inside the palace. And David was playing the lyre as usual, but Saul was holding a spear, and he threw it, thinking, I'll pin David to the wall. But David got away from him twice. Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with David, but had left Saul. Therefore, Saul sent David away from him and made him commander over a thousand men. David led the troops and continued to be successful in all his activities because the Lord was with him. When Saul observed that David was very successful, he dreaded him. But all Israel and Judah loved David because he was leading their troops. Saul told David, here's my oldest daughter, Merab. I'll give, you to her, I'll give her to you as a wife if you will be a warrior for me and fight the Lord's battles. But Saul was thinking, I don't need to raise a hand against him. Let the hand of the Philistines be against him. Then David responded, who am I and what is my family or my father's clan in Israel that I should become the king's son-in-law? When it was time to give Saul's daughter Merab to David, she was given to Adriel, the Meholothite, as a wife. Now, Saul's daughter Michael loved David, and when it was reported to Saul, it pleased him. I'll give her to him, Saul thought. She'll be a trap for him, and the hand of the Philistines will be against him. So Saul said to David a second time, Hey, you can now be my son-in-law. As Saul then ordered his servants, speak to David in private and tell him, look, the king is pleased with you and all his servants love you. Therefore, you should become the king's son-in-law. Saul's servants reported these words directly to David, but he replied, is it a trivial thing in your sight to become the king's son-in-law? I am a poor commoner. The servants reported back to Saul, these are the words David spoke. Then Saul replied, say this to David, the king desires no other bride price except a hundred Philistine foreskins to take revenge on his enemies. Actually, Saul intended to cause David's death at the hands of the Philistines. When the servants reported the terms to David, he was pleased to become the king's son-in-law. Before the wedding day arrived, David and his men went out and killed 200 Philistines. He brought their foreskins and presented them as a full payment to the king to become his son-in-law. Then Saul gave his daughter Michael to David as his wife. Saul realized that the Lord was with David and that his daughter Michael loved him. And he became even more afraid of David. As a result, Saul was David's enemy from then on. Every time the Philistine commanders came out to fight, David was more successful than all of Saul's officers. So his name became well known. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that we get to come together here. And Lord, we ask that in the midst of this time that you'd speak to our hearts that your Holy Spirit would be our teacher. God, that you would give us a willingness to hear what it is that you're saying. And God, a willingness to submit ourselves to you. God, have your hand on this time. Work in the midst of it. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. You know, in some ways, this passage is not at all what you would expect after reading chapter 17. I mean, think about this. Go back to chapter 17. It was there that King Saul, having been humiliated uh, because a mere shepherd boy had taken over leadership of the Israelite army by defeating the Philistine warrior Goliath, whom, whom Saul had been too terrified to face. Uh, you would think that at this point, Saul would be eating humble pie. And David, on the other hand, David, who had spent most of his life in the anonymity of shepherding, was suddenly elevated to hero status throughout all of Israel. Uh, his defeat of the giant Goliath made him famous. And having never led anything more than a few sheep, he suddenly finds himself in the leadership of Israel's army. 
And yet, and yet, it is Saul who we see here in chapter 18 being consumed by pride, and it is young David that we see embracing humility. It just goes to show you the pride does not really require any excellence. You don't have to do something to be proud of to be given over to pride. It doesn't come from your circumstances. It comes from your heart. Well, let's get started. Verse 1. Jonathan was bound to David in close friendship, loved him as much as he loved himself. Saul kept David with him from that day on. Jonathan made a covenant, in other words, a promise to God in regards to David because he loved him as much as himself. And Jonathan removed the robe he was wearing, gave it to David, along with his military tunic, his sword, his bow, and his belt. Now, let me briefly address something here. Uh, At times, uh, the loyal and selfless friendship between David and Jonathan has been portrayed as being something that it very clearly is not. Uh, Some people, I believe, wanting to justify either their own participation in or their support of the sin of homosexuality have sought to portray the friendship between David and Jonathan as being a, a homosexual relationship. Now, for three reasons, uh, this conjecture that is both preposterous and offensive, it, it is too often entertained as being a possibility. There are three reasons why I think people uh, mistakenly see this here. Uh, the first is this. Far too few people clearly understand the absolute Clarity with which the scriptures define both right and healthy sexuality, as well as the clarity with which scripture condemns all other sexual practices. Uh, both the Old Testament and the New Testament define right and healthy sexuality. Uh, just listen to Jesus as he quotes from Genesis in Matthew chapter 19, there in verses 4 through 6. And there Jesus says, haven't you read that he who created them in the beginning made them male and female? Guess what? I, I notice this, please. Gender is God made, not man chosen. And Jesus said, for this reason, a man, one man, will leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. And the two, one man and one woman, will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. And therefore, what God has joined together, this is not just the decision of man, but this is an act of God. This is something that God has done. What God has joined together, let no one separate. That, my friends, is healthy and right sexuality. God's rather obvious design is that one man and one woman will become one within the covenant of marriage for life. Anything outside of that is against God's design, including the whole alphabet of expressions of broken sexuality that is being thrust upon us by our culture. Scripture is clear. You don't believe me, read it for yourself. Look at passages like Leviticus 18, 22, passages like 1 Corinthians 6, or right in there around verse 9. And these, these passages both very clearly condemn all sorts of aberrant sexuality. The second reason that people misperceive this passage and misread what is said here about David and Jonathan is because our culture, having refused to find their identity and their value in the fact that they are made in the image of God, having refused to see the purpose of their life being created for fellowship with God, has instead chosen to try to find meaning, identity, and purpose in sexuality. And as a result, our culture has become so sexually fixated that absolutely everything is being presented as being about sex. Uh, 
And so when we read about a strong, selfless friendship between two men, they insert a sexual dynamic into it that just isn't there. Thirdly, our culture does not have a good picture of friendship anymore. Uh, The world's idea of friendship has been weakened. It has been diluted to an extent uh, by the cultural justification of self-centeredness and by an an acceptance of isolation uh, to the point that real friendship is not something that the world can recognize. And so when it sees something as intense and committed as the friendship between David and Jonathan, they assume that this must be more than a friendship and they assign to it something that it is not. You know, I think it would be an incredibly clarifying thing for our culture if you and I within the church began living out friendship, fellowship, the way that scripture describes it. If we were to begin to follow the lead of passages like 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 22, that talks about you and I showing each other sincere brotherly love, loving each other deeply from a pure heart, love one another constantly, it says. If the world saw us living like that amongst yeah, ourselves, I think they would, they would begin to see that friendship can be something far more than what they value it as. If we were to begin to follow the command of Jesus and to begin to love others, as Jesus says in Mark 12, 31, to love our neighbor as we love ourselves, I think the world would begin to see David and Jonathan in a new light. Well, David, now equipped for battle by Jonathan's selfless generosity, verse 5, he goes out to battle. He marches out with the army, and he is successful in everything Saul gives him to do. And so because of that, Saul put him in command of the fighting men, uh, which pleased all the people and Saul's servants as well. So God is with David, and God is blessing everything that David gives himself to. And David is finding success wherever he turns. Now, don't misunderstand the dynamic here. Things are going very well for David because God is with him. But very soon, things are not going to be going so well for David. And yet, let me assure you, God is every bit as much with David in that season as he is in this season. David himself assures us in Psalm 23, he says this, though I walk through the darkest valley, you are with me. God is not only with us when everything is going our way, but he is also with us when everything seems to be against us. In fact, I would say it seems to me that the Lord is even more with us in the midst of our troubles. No matter what you are experiencing, let me assure you of this. If you belong to him, if you have given yourself to Christ, if you have surrendered yourself to the Lord Jesus, then you can know this for sure. He will keep his promises. Promises like Hebrews 13, 5 where the Lord says this, he will never leave you or abandon you. Well, the thrill of success is about to turn into peril for David, and he becomes the literal target of Saul's jealous pride. Uh, So verse 6, when David was returning from killing the Philistine, the women came out to meet King Saul, singing, Saul has killed his thousands, but David his tens of thousands. This was not a tune that Saul particularly cared for. In fact, he was furious and resented the song. Why? Because they credited tens of thousands to David and only thousands to him. And so Saul concludes, what more can he have than the kingdom? I mean, they might as well crown him king right now. And so it says, Saul watched David jealously from that day forward. King Saul, fresh off the humiliation of being 
too afraid to face Goliath and having been exposed by the bravery of young David. Here he seems to be, well, a bit sensitive. He seems to be overreacting a bit to the women's song. And the ladies most likely meant nothing by it. They were just simply celebrating two of Israel's greatest heroes. But that was the problem. Saul wanted to be the only great hero of Israel. You see, because of pride, Saul felt that he must be preeminent. He could not be surpassed in any way by anyone at any time uh, without feeling that they were beginning to seek to usurp him. That's what pride is like. Pride cannot endure anyone else being recognized or applauded even for doing things that are generally and truly beneficial. And you see, the issue isn't whether or not something is worthy of praise. The issue is who receives the praise. And pride selfishly craves praise. It diminishes what others have done, it highlights what self has done, attributes others' success to mere luck, unfair advantage, or cheating, and attributes its own success to its awesome greatness. And pride, well, pride never travels alone, at least not for long. It is almost always accompanied by jealousy or envy. And jealousy and envy bring strife and disorder. James 3.16 reminds us where there is envy and selfish ambition, there is disorder and every evil practice doesn't take long before Saul's unchallenged pride and jealousy move him to attempt murder. Look at verse 10. The next day, an evil spirit sent from God came powerfully on Saul, and he began to rave inside the palace. David was playing the lyre as usual, but Saul was holding a spear, and he threw it, thinking, I'll pin David to the wall. But David got away from him twice. Now here in verse 10, some of your translations say that as Saul began to prophesy, well, others say that he began to rave, to talk like a madman would. Uh, the reason for this difference is how translators render the Hebrew word nabah. In another context, this word would describe the ecstatic altered state of a pagan prophet who claimed to be speaking a message from his God to be prophesying um, but here, uh, the word is used to describe the frenzied, vacant stupor that Saul seems to have fallen into when he came under the influence of this evil spirit. He was not prophesying under the control of the Holy Spirit, but rather he was raving under the influence of an evil spirit. It's somewhat the same dynamic, just a very different source and a very different outcome. And it was under the influence of that evil spirit that Saul sought to run David through with a spear. Twice. Murder. Murder is the second most extreme and uh, the most generally abhorred expression of pride. Uh, to think that your desire, your reasoning, your purpose, your choice is enough to destroy a human life well, that's almost the apex of arrogance. Saul, seeing David as a threat to his personal dynasty, seeks to murder him, to end his life. David, on the other hand, oh, what a stark contrast there is here between the two. At the risk to his own life, David sets aside his own safety in order to continue to be loyal to Saul and to serve him. Now think about this. David was a warrior. It likely would have been second nature uh, for David, after having dodged Saul's spear, to simply take it and to finish him. But David, David is under the influence and walking in the power of the Holy Spirit, not some evil spirit or even of his own flesh. And so he chooses not to lash out against the king. Instead, he escapes the king's presence and then he continues to serve him by leading the army out to battle. 
Here David, no doubt this is the work of the Holy Spirit in him, gives us a beautiful picture of real humility. David gives no place for insult, for anger, for fear, for indignation, for outrage. Instead, his focus is on continuing to do the thing that God has given him to do in great humility. David makes no provision for his flesh, for his wounded pride. He gives no foothold to sin. Which, by the way, friends, that is exactly what the Apostle Paul tells us that we're to do. Romans chapter 13, there in verse 14, Paul says this, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, put on the, the behaviors and the thought and the actions of Christ like you would put on a cloak and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. But what Paul is saying is that you and I, we are to live our lives in such a way that, that it is no longer about us. It is no longer us doing our thing for our purposes, for our benefit, but rather the living out of our life is as if we have put on Christ like a cloak and he is now living through us. In this moment, for David, it's not about him. It's about the Lord. It's about what the Lord desires, not what David wants to do. It's not about how David wants to respond. It's about David being faithful to do the thing that God has called him to do. On a side note, I want you to think back a few weeks for a moment and to remember what we considered back in chapter 16. It was there that because of Saul's uh, insistent rebellion against God uh, that this evil spirit began to torment him. And there, Saul's solution to this problem is that he would continue to refuse to repent of his rebellion and instead he would choose to find a musician and not that would drive away the evil spirit, but that would help him feel better in the midst of it all. You know, at first it seemed to be working. But now, at least from David's perspective, not so much. <laughs> Take a note of this. Masking symptoms never cures the disease. And I'm not talking about physical illness here. I'm talking about the spiritual if our focus is on feeling good while we ignore the cause of the issue, while we refuse to repent, it will only lead eventually to things getting worse. In case you're wondering, turning to Jesus, surrendering yourself fully to him, putting yourself into submission to him, drawing close to him, that is and always is the ultimate solution. Look at verse 12. Even though it was Saul who had tried to shish kebab David, look at what we read there. Saul was afraid of David. Saul's afraid of him. Saul was the one trying to do the killing, and yet Saul's afraid of David. Why? Well, Look at what it says, because the Lord was with David, but he had left Saul. The Lord was with David, but he had left Saul. Therefore, Saul sent David away from him. He sends him away, making a commander over a thousand men, sending him into more and more battle, more and more danger. Uh, but as he does this, David led the troops and continued to be successful because the Lord was with him. And Saul dreaded him but all of Israel and Judah loved David. The more Saul sought David's downfall, the more successful David became. And here's why. Having chosen him to be the next king, the Lord himself was raising David up. And no one, nobody could stop that. It didn't matter who was against David. When the Lord had chosen to raise him up, David was going to be exalted. And because Saul had turned away from God, the Lord was preparing to move him, to remove him from the scene. 
and it didn't matter how tightly Saul gripped his throne, he would be taken off of it. You know, friends, that's a good thing for us to remember in the moment in time in which we live. In a day when our culture is uh, becoming more and more violently opposed to who we are and what we believe, it is a good thing for us to remember that if God is for us, it really doesn't matter who's against us. <laughs> Saul doesn't understand that. And so he keeps plotting and striving against David and therefore against God. Uh, verse 17, Saul told David, hey, here's my oldest daughter, Merab. I'll give, you, I'll give her to you as a wife if you will be a warrior for me and fight the Lord's battles. But Saul was thinking, I don't need to raise a hand against him. Let the hand of the Philistines be against him. First, notice this. Saul had not kept his word about the reward for Goliath's slayer. Remember that? Do you remember the reward that was offered? It was not just the whole tax-free thing, but it was also that whoever killed Goliath would be given Saul's daughter in marriage. Well, that's Merab. Saul should have already given her to David as his wife. Secondly, notice that when it comes to rebellious pride, other people become mere pawns. Even Saul's own daughter becomes nothing more than a tool to be used to punish David. First, she's offered as a reward to cover Saul's cowardice in regards to Goliath, but now she's used as a bribe to induce David uh, to embrace greater danger, and then he makes it one step worse and pulls her away from David in order to further humiliate him. Saul is not thinking of anyone but himself, and that's what pride does. Pride is not concerned with what honors God. It only wants to honor itself. Pride doesn't care about a daughter's heart. It just uses her as a tool for conquest. Uh, pride doesn't even care about the nation over which you are supposed to be ruling. Even the defense of Israel and the battle against the Philistines is seen by Saul as nothing more than a tool to be used to try to get rid of David. And so we're not surprised. We see in verse 18, even though David responds in humility, uh, saying, who am I that I should be, become the king's son-in-law? And, and think about that for a minute. And think about this. Who is David? Uh, what, what a humble statement for him to make in the midst of this context. Because who is he? Well, he is now nationally famous. Remember that. All of Israel, it says, loved him. In fact, Saul's own staff loved him, which had to irritate the heck out of Saul. Saul's son and his heir, Jonathan, loved David. All over Israel, they are singing and dancing about David. Who was he? Well, he was the great slayer of Goliath. He was the leader of Israel's army. He was the future king. And yet in humility, David says, but who am I? Who am I to become this, the king's son-in-law? But then verse 19, King Saul uses Merab as nothing but a pawn and gives her to someone else. It's all almost as if Saul is just toying with David, just saying, hey, punk, I just want to let you know that I'm still in charge here, and, and, and you only get what I say you get. And that's how it goes, because I'm king. And then verse 20, we see that Saul's daughter, Michael, loved David. And when it was reported to Saul, it pleased him. I'll give her to him, Saul thought. She'll be a trap for him. What a sweet thing for a father to say about his daughter. <laughs> and the hand of the Philistines will be against him. So Saul arrogantly throws his second daughter at David. Again, he's only doing it because it is a part of his plan to do away with David. 
Saul thought that Michael would be a trap, but it doesn't tell us how it is. I think there are several things that Saul could have been thinking of. Uh, maybe it was the strange dowry that Saul intended to request. We'll read about that in verse 25. And uh, maybe it was that Saul knew that Michael didn't really love the Lord and that she would become a stumbling block to David. Uh, later on, we'll find out that, uh, that Michael has idols that she worships. And, and she even discourages David from wholeheartedly worshiping the Lord at one point. In one way or another, Saul sees her to be a trap for David, and so he offers her in Merab's place. But Saul knows there's a problem. David's humility is going to be a barrier that will have to be overcome. And so in verse 22, Saul orders his servants, tell David to marry her. Tell him, listen, dude, the king likes you. Everyone likes you. You, you should do this. And they did so. But David replied, is it trivial in your sight to uh, become the king's son-in-law? Do you not understand that I am a poor commoner? Uh, what David is saying is, listen, I cannot afford to be married to a princess. I cannot afford a princess's dowry. That's the, the bride price that would be paid to the father of the bride by the groom. Now, when this is reported to Saul in verses 24 and 25, he springs his trap. And Saul replied, say this to David, the king desires no other bride price except a hundred Philistine foreskins. Yuck. <laughs> in order to take revenge upon his enemies. You see, Saul, Saul's whole purpose was to get David killed. Look at verse 25. Saul intended to cause David's death at the hand of the Philistines. Now think about that for a minute. Saul knew that his daughter Michael loved David, and yet he was willing to make her marriage to him become the cause of his death. Well, just as Saul had hoped, uh, verse 26, David rather liked the idea. I don't know what David was thinking, but that's what it says. And so before the wedding day arrived, David and his groomsmen made a little foray into Philistine territory, and they somehow uh, got the uh, foreskins of 200 Philistines. I'm thinking they didn't give them up willingly. They probably gave them up only after they were dead. And so he brought this pile of foreskins and presented them as a full payment to the king. I, I pity the guy whose job was to count them. <laughs> We're still one short. <laughs> and then Saul gave his daughter Michael to David as his wife. I don't, I don't even want to think of what this looked like. I kind of wonder if David did this just so he could dump that mess right in front of Saul's tent. And probably not. David seems to be walking in the spirit. I think likely, I think likely that David loved Michael, which ought to serve as a warning to you singles. You better make sure that you know the reality of the spiritual life of someone before you marry them. Well, in verse 28, we read that Saul realized that the Lord was with David and that his daughter, Michael, did truly love him. And he became even more afraid of David and as a result, look at this, Saul was David's enemy from then on. Saul not only saw David as being an enemy, but now he made himself David's enemy from that point onward. And so the die is cast, the decision has been made, and Saul will forever view David as an enemy. His best soldier... Truly, I think, his, his most loyal and trustworthy citizen rejected 
all because of rebellious pride. All because of pride's lust to have and to keep power at all cost. Be careful, friends. Beware of pride. Listen to Scripture's warnings again and again against it. Consider the Proverbs. Proverbs 11.2 says, When arrogance comes, disgrace follows. But with humility comes wisdom. Again, Proverbs 29.23, A person's pride will humble him, but a humble spirit will gain honor. And of course, the one we're all used to hearing, Proverbs 16, 18, pride comes before destruction and an arrogant spirit before a fall. The short version, reject pride. Reject pride, choose and embrace humility. Be on your guard. I mentioned earlier that the second greatest expression of arrogance was murder. Did it make you wonder what the first one might be? I would say that the ultimate expression of pride and arrogance is refusing God's mercy. It's refusing his sacrifice in your place. It's looking God in the eye and saying, you know what, God? I'm as good as you are. I measure up. I don't need your forgiveness. I don't need your grace or your mercy. Oh, how pride blinds us. So this morning, we are going to end our time. We're going to end our time by remembering the ultimate picture of humility and grace, the cross. <laughs> We're going to end our time by sharing together in what we call the Lord's table or communion. And what it is really is, is a time that Jesus gave to his disciples, something that he told them that he wanted them to do in order to remember his death until he came again. Why would he want them to do that? Because it was by his death in our place that he purchased our forgiveness. Jesus had gathered with his closest disciples and together they were celebrating the Passover dinner. When during the, the midst of the dinner, Jesus took bread and it says that he gave thanks for it. He broke it and he gave it to his disciples. And he said something rather odd to them. He said, take this, eat it. This is my body given for you. I have to think they had no clue what he was talking about. They probably pretended they did. But I think they, they likely were rather confused by all of it. But then hours later and days later as the Holy Spirit began to speak to their hearts and to teach them and to open their eyes, they began to see what it was that he was saying. That his body was offered as sacrifice in payment for our sin. His body on the cross was given over to bear the load of my guilt and shame yours as well. A little later after supper that same evening, Jesus took the cup and he gave it to his disciples and he said, take and drink this. This is my blood which is poured out for the forgiveness of your sin. And again, I, I, I doubt at that time that they really understood what he was talking about. But after the crucifixion and his resurrection and his ascension, after the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and as God began to warm their hearts and open their minds, I think they got it. 
It was his blood, his life poured out, paying the price for my sin and washing me clean. It's the grace of God. It's forgiveness offered to all who are willing to embrace the humility of acknowledging their need to set aside pride, to shut down the arrogance of thinking that we are good enough that we measure up and to instead receive the free gift of forgiveness that is offered to us because of the Savior's death in our place. And so Jesus told his disciples, I want you to do this in remembrance of me. Do this to remember my death until I come. So that's, that's why we do what we do. And so this morning, I invite you, if you belong to Jesus, if you have surrendered yourself to him, if you have simply admitted your guilt to him, your need for his forgiveness, and you have received that forgiveness from him, then this is for you. And I invite you as we return to worship, and guys, come on, come on back up and lead us in worship as we return to worship, to come and to take one of the pairs of, uh, of cups, uh, they're nested together in the bottom cup, there's a little nugget of bread in the top cup, a, a swallow of juice. And you can return to your seat and between you and the Lord as we worship, you can take a moment to remember, to consider his body given for you, his blood, poured out for the forgiveness of your sin. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you for this time together. We thank you for your word. God, we thank you for the, the ugly, ugly picture of Saul in his pride, the beautiful picture of David in humility, and the perfect picture of Jesus, our humble king, our savior, our rescuer. We recognize, Lord, we confess our sin, our, our failure, our lack. God, we need your forgiveness, your cleansing, your payment on our behalf. And so, Lord, we come humbly. We come with hearts filled with worship to recognize you is King and Lord over all, the Savior of our souls. We worship you. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen.